Hello students, this is Professor McDermott. Uh, welcome to History 4820. This is a special topics course in history and the topic is religion and politics in early America. However, um, in order to understand uh, anything about that subject, we have to know something about the Reformation in Europe, the Protestant Reformation, and also the Catholic Counter-Reformation in Europe because all of the many um, religious groups uh, that were present in, uh, in early America, colonial America and the early Republic, were all influenced in some way by the events of the Reformation. And so that's what we're going to cover in this first um, video lecture. And the Reformation, of course, um, officially starts <laughs> with uh, this man, Martin Luther. Uh, there were stirrings of reformed activity before Luther, um, but the Reformation as a, as a mass movement that swept across Europe started with Martin Luther, who interestingly enough, before he became a Protestant reformer, was actually a Catholic priest. Um, he was also a professor of Bible studies uh, at the University of Wittenberg in the Holy Roman Empire, now part of uh, Germany. And uh, he was a very good professor, very conscientious, uh, very well liked by his students, and he was an excellent priest. Um, he did all the things that he was supposed to do as a priest in order to ensure his own um, salvation. Now, I have to explain something very important here. Um, in the Catholic Church, then and now, the official teaching about salvation is that um, people are saved by God's grace. Uh, that is, by uh, the free gift of salvation offered by Jesus on the cross. However, in order to obtain salvation, the believer who's justified by faith in Christ must also perform good works, must do good deeds in this world uh, in order to obtain salvation as well. So yes, there is an element of grace coming from God, but there's a sense in the Catholic religion that people also have to do good works in order to get to heaven. Well, Luther's problem <laughs> was that he was doing all the good works, and yet he could never quite convince himself that he was saved, that he was actually going to heaven. And this caused him a lot of anxiety and a lot of um, turmoil. Until one day, it is said, Luther was sitting in the tower of his uh, monastery in Wittenberg, and he was reading over the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, chapter 1, and his eye fell on verse 16, which reads, The just man is saved by faith. The just man is saved by faith. And um, at that moment, in the mind of Martin Luther, uh, a light bulb went off and he said, aha, I have found the answer. Good works and good deeds have nothing to do with salvation. Yes, Christians should do good deeds because uh, the Ten Commandments tell us to do them and Christ tells us to do them. But really, salvation depends entirely on the gift of faith, which is a free gift from God that we can do nothing um, to merit. We can't do anything to earn this free gift of faith. Um, it's, an, it's an act of grace on the part of God. Um, and so this really became the basis for um, the Protestant Reformation. And um, as time went on, uh, Luther developed um, three major slogans. Uh, that really expressed what he was trying to achieve at first within the Catholic Church. The first one was faith alone, again based on that passage from Romans. Um, the second is grace alone, in other, in other words emphasizing that salvation is entirely a gift of God's grace, that we can't do anything to earn uh, salvation, and that our good works in this life have nothing to do with whether we're going to heaven or not. The third slogan is uh, scripture alone. 
Um, now, you have to understand that in the Catholic Church, Scripture was always important uh, as a source of Christian truth, but Catholics also believe that you have to follow um, the teachings of the Apostles, the early Christians, uh, the apostolic generation at the beginning of, of Christian history, and that you should also follow the teaching of the Pope um, when he teaches in union with all the bishops of the church. So there are multiple sources of truth within the Catholic religion. Luther said, I want to get rid of all that. From now on, uh, the only thing the Christian needs in order to know how to act, how to live uh, their life in this world is the scripture, that is the, the Holy Bible. And um, Luther wanted to make the Bible more accessible to ordinary people. Um, previously, the official language of the Catholic Church was and is Latin, um, and the Bible was only available in Latin. So if you didn't read Latin, you really couldn't read the Bible. Um, but Luther made the first German translation of the Holy Scriptures um, and uh, in that way made the scriptures more accessible to ordinary people. And this would become very, very important in early America. Um, Americans were always very uh, much uh, proud of the fact that they had a high literacy rate, um, that the Bible was widely available, and that people were uh, reading it. And Protestants in early America uh, repeatedly contrasted that fact with the practices of the Catholic Church whom they accused of preventing people from having access to um, the Bible. So that would become an important theme in American religion, um, this emphasis on scripture alone. Well, um, according to uh, most accounts, <laughs> The Protestant Reformation begins in the year 1517 when um, Luther uh, wrote up a document called the 95 Theses attacking the Catholic teaching on um, purgatory. We don't really have to go into that, I think, in this lecture um, because it wasn't a huge issue in early America. But the 95 Theses are Luther's attack on the Catholic doctrine of purgatory. And it's said that he marched down to the cathedral church at Wittenberg and uh, nailed them to the door. And uh, subsequently, uh, the 95 Theses were printed on uh, the new printing press, which had been invented in the previous century by Johann Gutenberg in Germany. So that was now available to spread the 95 Theses and Luther's many other writings, as well as his new translation of the Holy Bible, to... Um, too many people within the Holy Roman Empire. And so Luther's ideas began to spread um, like wildfire. Luther didn't really intend to leave um, the Catholic Church at first and start his own denomination, but um, he was excommunicated by uh, the Catholic Church, that is, he was kicked out. <laughs> um, and so um, he did establish the Lutheran Church in Germany um, and much of Germany, especially northern Germany, did become Protestant and uh, joined this new Lutheran church, which was organized with the help of important lords, um, princes, and political leaders in Germany. So in terms of Luther's views on church and state, for the most part, Luther taught that um, Christians should be obedient to their rulers. And in a way, he had to teach that because he was dependent upon those rulers for support as he tried to, uh, to foster um, his new church. Um, Lutheranism, I would say, did not have a huge influence, per se, in um, early America, although there were Lutherans, um, in, especially in Pennsylvania, um, but, um, obviously the ideas and the teachings of Martin Luther, um, and the attitude, uh, that he had about the freedom of the Christian, um, which, uh, you'll read about in the, in the document that I was signed for you, um, were very influential in early America as, as they were everywhere. But Luther was not the only, 
um, important leader of the Reformation in Europe. Another really key figure is this man, John Calvin, or Jean Calvin, um, as he would have called himself, because he was uh, a Frenchman who studied at uh, the greatest university of the time, the University of uh, Paris. And while he was there, uh, he came into contact with Lutheran teachings, decided to become a Protestant Christian. Um, but he struck out in his own um, new direction when he published the first edition of the Institutes of the Christian Religion in the year 1536. And there would be many other revised editions after this. But this was an incredibly um, important work of um, the Reformation in which Calvin set out his vision of what a Christian church um, should look like. And the book um, instantly caused a sensation in the city of Geneva, Switzerland, where many people read it, and they were so interested that they invited Calvin to come down um, to Geneva to um, to spread his teachings even even further. And over time, and with many ups and downs, uh, essentially Calvin and the Calvinist reformed movement took over that city of Geneva and turned it into what we call a uh, theocracy. Uh, a theocracy is when um, a religion or a church uh, is essentially in control of the government. There aren't many theocracies left in the world today, but um, there are a few, especially in the um, Islamic world, the more uh, extreme uh, fundamentalist Muslim countries like Iran, you could call them um, theocracies. Um, one key uh, idea <laughs> that John Calvin developed essentially took Luther's idea of grace alone and drew out the logical implications of that. Um, so Luther uh, had taught that all salvation was a free gift of God's grace. There was nothing we could do to earn or merit um, salvation. And Calvin said, okay, well, if that's the case, then obviously that means that only God decides who is going to heaven and who is going to hell. God decides who to give that gift of faith to and who to withhold it from, all right? So <laughs> all salvation is simply uh, God's decision. Our acts and our decisions have nothing to do with it. Um, this is the doctrine of predestination, that God predestines some people to heaven and um, actually predestines some people to hell, and that there's absolutely nothing that anyone can do to alter the God's decree of predestination. Now, you may ask the question, because this is so different, I think, from modern approaches to religion, and even the churches that were founded by Calvinists have mostly moved away from this position of predestination. You may ask why anybody would have found this um, attractive. Well, many people found it very attractive and very inspiring and very liberating. You have to imagine, let's say you had grown up um, especially if you had grown up in the Catholic Church, anxiously trying to please God through uh, doing uh, good works all your life without being certain whether those good works were, were really being accepted by God for your salvation. Um, here comes John Calvin saying that uh, that isn't how it works, that people are simply predestined to heaven or hell, that could be a very liberating teaching, as long as you could convince yourself that you were one of the ones that were going to heaven, <laughs> that you were one of the elect, the chosen, whom God had chosen for salvation. If you could convince yourself of that, that you were one of the elect, then Calvinism was incredibly, um, incredibly liberating and, and very, very attractive, and it was to many people. Now, there were people who um, were Calvinists who became convinced that they were predestined to hell. <laughs> and of course, for them, life was, uh, life was miserable. But I think the vast majority of people were able to convince themselves that they were definitely going to heaven. They were assured of salvation. Um, and therefore, they found the Calvinist religion very appealing. And so Calvin and his teachings began to attract followers 
um, uh, throughout Europe, and many of those uh, followers of John Calvin, Calvinists or Reformed Christians, we call them, uh, would ultimately come to um, America. Among them, of course, were the Puritans in um, New England. And so it won't surprise you when I say that another of John Calvin's teachings was that Christians should really try to create um, a very godly society in which um, Christian teachings were taken seriously and Christians treated each other with Christian love and concern, but also a society in which morals were strictly policed and things like adultery and drunkenness and fornication were absolutely um, forbidden. Um, that's what Geneva was like. If you got caught doing anything against the Ten Commandments or any of uh, Calvin's teachings, you would be hauled in front of what was called the consistory, consistory which was a church committee, and, and you would be punished. Um, and of course, the, the New England Puritans established a similar kind of discipline um, when they came over to this country. Um, <laughs> you might ask yourself, if people are predestined to heaven or hell, and if what we do in this life really doesn't matter, um, then why should you care about, uh, you know, necessarily following the commandments or following the laws of society? Um, if you knew you were going to heaven, uh, it really wouldn't matter. Even if you broke the law, you were still going to heaven. So why not do all those things? Well, <laughs> as we will see uh, later in the course, that would become an issue in New England in what was called the antinomian controversy centered around Anne Hutchinson. So hold that issue um, in your mind. But officially, the Calvinist teaching was, even though uh, only God decided who was going to heaven, and even though our good deeds didn't matter, still Christians were obliged to follow the teachings of the Bible and its laws, and uh, therefore should lead a, a, uh, what, was, what they considered to be a godly, moral, upright, and Christian life. The Reformation in England took a different course from the Reformation on the continent of Europe, which was more driven by theological ideas um, and this will be review for those of you who have taken my directed readings course on Tudor and Stuart England. Um, but it is important that we understand how the Reformation came about in England. It mostly had to do with the marital history <laughs> of the man in the picture there, King Henry um, VIII, um, who began to reign in 1509. Now, King Henry uh, married uh, a Spanish princess, Catherine of Aragon, and they were happily married for uh, many years. However, um, Catherine had had a number of miscarriages, and, and, and some of the children that they had together had died. So only one of the children of Henry and Catherine survived into adulthood, and that was a girl, Mary, uh, Princess Mary. And that made King Henry VIII very nervous because he was only the second t king of the Tudor dynasty. The dynasty was somewhat weak and insecure. And England had never, up to that point in time, been ruled by a woman in her own right. Um, and so Henry really badly wanted to have a son and it looked like Catherine was never going to have a son. In 1527, um, Henry, was smitten uh, and became very attracted to a young woman at his court named um, Anne Boleyn. And uh, <laughs> Anne was a very clever young woman and she really played uh, Henry very um, shrewdly. And ultimately Henry decided that he had to have Anne Boleyn and marry her and um, so he presented a petition to the Pope because Henry was still a, a good Catholic at this point in time and divorce is not permitted, of course, officially in the Catholic religion. But you can get what's called an annulment. Uh, if you provide some grounds uh, for it, you can get an annulment from the church. So Henry went to the Pope and he said, I'm seeking an annulment because 
Catherine was married to my older brother, Arthur, before um, she was married to me, which was true. Arthur had died young, and then his widow, Catherine, had married Henry. And Henry claimed at this point he had developed scruples about that, uh, that he thought it went against the Bible, and therefore he was applying to the Pope to annul his marriage so that he could marry Anne Boleyn. Well, the Pope of that time, Pope Clement VII, really didn't know what to do. <laughs> On the one hand, he didn't want to lose England um, to the Protestant Reformation or offend Henry. On the other hand, the current Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, was the nephew of Queen Catherine of Aragon, and the Pope could not afford to offend Emperor Charles either. And so he waffled, that is, he, he simply didn't do anything. He dithered. Um, he appointed commission after commission to study the issue and tried to postpone any kind of decision. Well, um, eventually Henry got tired of this, and finally in 1533, he got the Archbishop of Canterbury to declare that um, his first marriage had been annulled and to marry him to um, Anne Boleyn, who became the famous uh, queen for a thousand days, because <laughs> eventually... Um, Henry would get tired of her as well and chop her head off and have four more wives after um, Anne Boleyn. But first, Anne would give birth to the future queen, Elizabeth uh, I, one of the greatest monarchs in British history. Um, well, anyway, um, because uh, Henry had disobeyed the Pope, um, he decided in 1534 to take the... Um, Church of England completely out of the Catholic Church, and he got Parliament, the English legislature, to pass a law called the Act of Supremacy, which made him, King Henry VIII, the supreme head of the Church in England, not the Pope. And actually, the English monarch today is still the head of the Church of England, the supreme official head, um, Queen Elizabeth II, according to this law of 1534. And so that is how the English Reformation happened, and it's very interesting and somewhat surprising that nearly all the bishops of the church and the priests of the church went along with this and did not protest. I think they thought that eventually Henry would get over it and, and, and go back to the Catholic Church. <coughs> this kind of thing had happened before in European history, uh, but in this case it never did, and the Church of England is uh, still a Protestant church uh, to this day. One important leader who did speak out against um, the changes in the Church of England was Sir Thomas More. More was the Lord Chancellor of England, that is the highest uh, legal officer in the kingdom. But he was also a very devout Catholic and he simply felt he could not go along with the divorce and the changes in the church. And so, ultimately, um, Moore was convicted of treason on very trumped up charges and um, had his head chopped off in 1536. His last words on the scaffold were, I die the king's good servant, but God's first. So what winds up happening on the island of Great Britain um, in England is that you have the Protestant Church of England, sometimes known as the Anglican Church, um, with the monarch as the supreme head, but the day-to-day -day running of the church was done by bishops, and so we call this an Episcopalian type of church. When bishops are in charge, the Greek word for bishop is epis episcopus, um, so we call this an Episcopalian church, and in fact the Church of England in America is called the Episcopalian um, Church. Um, and um, several colonies were predominantly Episcopalian, um, including uh, Virginia, the Carolinas, and uh, Georgia. So the Church of England would be quite influential in early America as well. Um, the Church of England actually was somewhat Calvinist in terms of theology, ultimately. But both Henry VIII and Queen Elizabeth I really liked a Catholic type of uh, service. You know, they liked the priests to wear special robes, and they liked to have candles, you know, and incense, and 
beautiful music and, and, and so forth. And so the uh, worship of the Church of England still looked very Catholic. And there were other practices too that were retained from the earlier Catholic period in England. And that made certain people within the Church of England very angry. The ones who were the more extreme Calvinists um, who began to be called Puritans because they wanted to purify the Church of England as they saw it and to get rid of everything that was left of Catholic teaching and practice. So for instance, Puritans um, did not celebrate Christmas. Um, they thought that was an abomination and so in fact in, when the Puritans came to New England they banned the celebration of Christmas. They did not believe in the sign of the cross. They thought priests should not wear special clothes. Um, their services were very simple, usually consisting of a long sermon and some uh, singing of psalms uh, from uh, the Bible. They didn't believe in wedding rings. There were other things they wanted to get rid of because they simply saw them as too Catholic. All right. So um, keep that in mind as we talk about the New England Puritans. And also keep in mind that, in a sense, the Puritans were going against their government and being very critical of their government, more than, say, a Martin Luther would have uh, agreed with, because they simply thought the Church of England was wrong about um, many things. So sometimes Calvinists, and especially these Puritans, could take quite a critical stance towards the state, the government. Um, also, though, you should understand that at this point in time, the Kingdom of Scotland was still um, independent, the northern part of the island of uh, Great Britain. And the Scottish Reformation happened in um, a rather different way. There was a Calvinist revolution in Scotland, which overthrew the Queen, Mary Queen of Scots, um, put her son King James the sixth on the throne and while James was a small boy uh, these Calvinist leaders instituted the Church of Scotland which they called the Kirk in Scottish dialect now the Kirk as it evolved um, was a Presbyterian church which means that it was ruled not by bishops but by ministers in individual churches and every now and then now and then all the ministers would get together in a big meeting called a synod and it was the ministers who would make decisions for uh, the Scottish Presbyterian um, Church which was very strongly Calvinist in terms of its theology had a very uh, much simplified form of reformed worship looked quite different from Episcopal worship and this would be very influential in America because numerous Scots-Irish Presbyterians would come over and establish many Presbyterian um, churches in um, early America. So we're going to run into that as well as we go on through um, the course. Finally, um, it's very important to realize that uh, in response to the Reformation, the Catholic Church did reorganize and regroup somewhat under a succession of reform-minded popes um, to try to answer the criticisms offered by Luther and Calvin and others, um, and essentially to clean up their act uh, within uh, the Catholic Church, because there were um, quite a number of abuses that had crept into uh, the church. Um, so for instance, there were many priests who did not read Latin. And so when they, when they read the services, they had no idea what they were even saying um, or doing. There were many priests that violated the rules about celibacy and had wives and mistresses and concubines and so forth. Um, there was the issue of the selling of indulgences which Luther was especially angry about. Um, and so in 1545, a great council of the bishops of the Catholic Church was convened in the city of Trent in northern Italy, and it met off and on until 1563. We call this the Council of Trent. Um, now, the Council of Trent 
did not accept the Lutheran teaching on um, grace alone or faith alone. They stuck to the traditional Catholic teaching that good works were necessary for um, salvation. However, they did try to uh, eliminate and, or at least address some of the abuses which the reformers had criticized. Um, they banned the selling of indulgences, and they also promoted the creation of seminaries, that is, colleges where priests could actually receive a good formation in um, the Christian faith before they went out to minister to um, the people and to promote better uh, adherence or, or less hypocritical attitude towards Christian morality um, or the teaching of the church by uh, the priests. So there were um, a number of important developments coming out of the Council of Trent and many important reform leaders within the Catholic Church during this counter-reformation. One of the most important <clears throat> was the man in the picture there, St. Ignatius Loyola, who had a very interesting history. Uh, Ignatius started out his career as a soldier, but at the Battle of Pamplona in uh, northern Spain, his leg was shattered into dozens of pieces by a cannonball. And while he was recuperating and undergoing numerous painful surgeries without anesthesia, um, Ignatius was reading um, the lives of the saints, uh, the Catholic saints, and he had a deep religious conversion and decided that he too wanted to become um, a saint. And in order to achieve this, uh, he founded a new organization called the Society of Jesus, better known as um, the Jesuits. And um, the Jesuits nowadays are chiefly known for education. In fact, they run a number of colleges in the U.S., such as um, Georgetown, Gonzaga, Loyola Chicago, Xavier, um, and St. Louis University, where I got my PhD. <laughs> so I know quite a bit about um, the Jesuits. But uh, initially, the Jesuits were missionaries. That is, they were um, sent all over the world by the Pope to conduct missions, um, the goal of which was to convert indigenous people to um, the Catholic form of um, Christianity. And Jesuit missions extended as far away as India, China, Japan, and um, North America. And we're going to be reading um, uh, some documents from the Jesuit uh, Relations, which is the chronicle of the Jesuit missions uh, within North America. So I wanted you to know about them. Um, there were not a great many Catholics in early America. However, one colony, Maryland, initially was founded by Lord Baltimore as a Catholic refuge, although the government of the colony was eventually taken over by uh, Protestants within the colony. There was uh, always a strong Catholic presence within uh, Maryland, but um, elsewhere <laughs> in the English colonies there uh, and within Maryland as well, there was a great deal of prejudice um, against Catholics. Um, so keep that in mind as well as we look at these uh, documents on religion and politics in early America going forward with the course. <clears throat>